when the wind is blowing, and the sleet or rain is driving against the dark windows, I love to sit by the fire, thinking of what I have read in books of voyage and travel. Such books have had a strong fascination for my mind from my earliest childhood, and I wonder it should have come to pass that I never have been round the world, never have been shipwrecked, ice environed, tomahawked, or eaten. Sitting on my ruddy hearth in the twilight of New Year's Eve, I find incidents of travel rise around me from all the latitudes and longitudes of the globe. They observe no order or sequence, but appear and vanish as they will. Come like shadows, so depart. Columbus, alone upon the sea with his disaffected crew, looks over the waste of waters from his high station on the poop of his ship, and sees the first uncertain glimmer of the light, rising and falling with the waves, like a torch in the bark of some fisherman, which is the shining star of a new world. Bruce is caged in Abyssinia, surrounded by the gory horrors which will often startle him out of his sleep at home when years have passed away. Franklin, come to the end of his unhappy overland journey, would that it had been his last, lies perishing of hunger with his brave companions, each emaciated figure stretched upon its miserable bed, without the power to rise. All dividing the weary days between their prayers, their remembrances of the dear ones at home, and conversation on the pleasures of eating, the last-named topic being ever present to them likewise in their dreams. All the African travellers, wayworn, solitary and sad, submit themselves again to drunken, murderous, man-selling despots of the lowest order of humanity, and Mungo Park, fainting under a tree, and succoured by a woman, gratefully remembers how his good Samaritan has always come to him in woman's shape, the wide world over. A shadow on the wall, in which my mind's eye can discern some traces of a rocky sea-coast, recalls to me a fearful story of travel, derived from that unpromising narrator of such stories, a parliamentary blue book. A convict is its chief figure, and this man escapes with other prisoners from a penal settlement. It is an island, and they seize a boat and get to the mainland. Their way is by a rugged and precipitous seashore, and they have no earthly hope of ultimate escape, for the party of soldiers, dispatched by an easier course to cut them off, must inevitably arrive at their distant bourne long before them, and retake them, if by any hazard they survive the horrors of the way. Famine, as they all must have foreseen, besets them early in their course. Some of the party die, and are eaten. Some are murdered by the rest, and eaten. In the pockets on one side of his coarse convict dress are portions of the man's body, on which he is regaling. In the pockets on the other side is an untouched store of salted pork, stolen before he left the island, for which he has no appetite. He is taken back, and he is hanged. But I shall never see that sea beach, on the wall, or in the fire, without him. Solitary monster, eating as he prowls along, while the sea rages and rises at him. Captain Bly! a worse man to be entrusted with arbitrary power there could scarcely be, is handed over the side of the bounty, and turned adrift on the wide ocean in an open boat, by order of Fletcher Christian, one of his officers, at this very minute. Another flash of my fire, and Thursday October Christian, five and twenty years of age, son of the dead and gone Fletcher by a savage mother, leaps aboard his majesty's ship Britain, hove to of Pitcairn's Island, says his simple grace before eating in good English, and knows that a pretty little animal on board is called a dog, because in his childhood he had heard of such strange creatures from his father and the other mutineers, grown grey under the shade of the breadfruit trees, speaking of their lost country far away. See the hails well, East Indiaman, outward bound, driving madly on a January night towards the rocks near Seacombe, on the island of Purbeck. The captain's two dear daughters are aboard, and five other ladies. The ship has been driving many hours, has seven feet water in her hold, and her mainmast has been cut away. Roused by a sense of their danger, 
the same seaman at this moment, in frantic exclamations, demanded of heaven and their fellow sufferers that succour which their own efforts, timely made, might possibly have procured. The ship continued to beat on the rocks, and soon bilging fell with her broadside towards the shore. When she struck, a number of the men climbed up the ensign staff, under an apprehension of her immediately going to pieces. Mr. Merriton, at this crisis, offered to these unhappy beings the best advice which could be given. He recommended that all should come to the side of the ship lying lowest on the rocks, and singly to take the opportunities which might then offer of escaping to the shore. Having thus provided, to the utmost of his power, for the safety of the desponding crew, he returned to the roundhouse, where, by this time, all the passengers and most of the officers had assembled. The latter were employed in offering consolation to the unfortunate ladies, and with unparalleled magnanimity, suffering their compassion for the fair and amiable companions of their misfortunes to prevail over the sense of their own danger. In this charitable work of comfort, Mr. Merriton now joined by assurances of his opinion that the ship would hold together till the morning, when all would be safe. Captain Pierce, observing one of the young gentlemen loud in his exclamations of terror, and frequently cried that the ship was parting, cheerfully bid him be quiet, remarking that, though the ship should go to pieces, he would not, but would be safe enough. It is difficult to convey a correct idea of the scene of this deplorable catastrophe, without describing the place where it happened. The hills well struck on the rocks, at a part of the shore where the cliff is of vast height, and rises almost perpendicular from its base. But at this particular spot, the foot of the cliff is excavated into a cavern of ten or twelve yards in depth, and of breadth equal to the length of a large ship. But when she struck, it was too dark for the unfortunate persons on board to discover the real magnitude of the danger, and the extreme horror of such a situation. In addition to the company already in the roundhouse, they had admitted three black women and two soldiers' wives, who, with the husband of one of them, had been allowed to come in, though the seamen, who had tumultuously demanded entrance to get the lights, had been opposed and kept out by Mr. Rogers and Mr. Brimer, the third and fifth mates. Captain Pierce sat on a chair, a cot, or some other movable, with a daughter on each side, whom he alternately pressed to his affectionate breast. The rest of the melancholy assembly were seated on the deck, which was strewed with musical instruments, and the wreck of furniture and other articles. Here also Mr. Merriton, after having cut several wax candles in pieces, and stuck them up in various parts of the roundhouse, and lighted up all the glass lanterns he could find, took his seat, intending to wait the approach of dawn, and then assist the partners of his dangers to escape. But observing that the poor ladies appeared parched and exhausted, he brought a basket of oranges, and prevailed on some of them to refresh themselves by sucking a little of the juice. At this time they were all tolerably composed, except Miss Mansell, who was in hysteric fits on the floor of the deck of the roundhouse. But on Mr. Merriton's return to the company, he perceived a considerable alteration in the appearance of the ship. The sides were visibly giving way, the deck seemed to be lifting, and he discovered other strong indications that she could not hold much longer together. On this account he attempted to go forward to look out, but immediately saw that the ship had separated in the middle, and that the forepart, having changed its position, lay rather further out towards the sea. In such an emergency, when the next moment might plunge him into eternity, he determined to seize the present opportunity, and follow the example of the crew and the soldiers, who were now quitting the ship in numbers, and making their way to the shore, though quite ignorant of its nature and description. Among other expedients, the ensign staff had been unshipped, and attempted to be laid between the ship's side and some of the rocks, but without success, for it snapped asunder before it reached them. However, by the light of a lanthorn, which a seaman handed through the skylight of the roundhouse to the deck, Mr. Merriton discovered a spar, which appeared to be laid from the ship's side to the rocks, and on this spar he resolved to attempt his escape. Accordingly, lying down upon it, he thrust himself forward. However, he soon found that it had no communication with the rock. 
he reached the end of it, and then slipped off. Receiving a very violent bruise in his fall, and before he could recover his legs he was washed off by the surge, Mr. Brimer had followed him to the poop, where they remained together about five minutes. When on the breaking of this heavy sea, they jointly seized a hen-coop. The same wave which proved fatal to some of those below, carried him and his companion to the rock, on which they were violently dashed, and miserably bruised. Here on the rock were twenty-seven men, but it now being low water, and as they were convinced that on the flowing of the tide all must be washed off, many attempted to get to the back or the sides of the cavern, beyond the reach of the returning sea. Scarcely more than six, besides Mr. Rogers and Mr. Brimer, succeeded. Mr. Rogers, on gaining the station, was so nearly exhausted, that had his exertions been protracted only a few minutes longer, he must have sunk under them. He was now prevented from joining Mr. Meryton, by at least twenty men between them, none of whom could move without the imminent peril of his life. They found that a very considerable number of the crew, seamen and soldiers, and some petty officers, were in the same situation as themselves, though many who had reached the rocks below perished in attempting to ascend. They could yet discern some part of the ship, and in their dreary station solaced themselves with the hopes of its remaining entire until daybreak, for, in the midst of their own distress, the sufferings of the females on board affected them with the most poignant anguish and every sea that broke inspired them with terror for their safety. God knows all he does for the poor baby. How he cheerfully carries him in his arms when he himself is weak and ill. How he feeds him when he himself is griped with want. How he folds his ragged jacket round him, lays his little worn face with a woman's tenderness upon his sunburnt breast, soothes him in his sufferings, sings to him as he limps along, unmindful of his own parched and bleeding feet. Divided for a few days from the rest, they dig a grave in the sand, and bury their good friend the cooper, these two companions alone in the wilderness. And then the time comes when they both are ill, and beg their wretched partners in despair, reduced and few in number now, to wait by them one day. They wait by them one day. They wait by them two days. On the morning of the third, they move very softly about, in making their preparations for the resumption of their journey, for the child is sleeping by the fire, and it is agreed with one consent that he shall not be disturbed until the last moment. The moment comes, the fire is dying, and the child is dead. His faithful friend the steward lingers but a little while behind him. His grief is great. He staggers on for a few days, lies down in the desert, and dies but he shall be reunited in his immortal spirit, who can doubt it, with the child, when he and the poor carpenter shall be raised up with the words, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these, ye have done it unto me. Oh, for a day, he would exclaim, for but one day to make amends. But the sun never shone upon that happy day, and out of his remote captivity he never came. Why does this traveller's fate obscure, on New Year's Eve, the other histories of travellers with which my mind was filled but now, and cast a solemn shadow over me. Must I one day make his journey? Even so. Who shall say that I may not then be tortured by such late regrets? That I may not then look from my exile on my empty place and undone work? I stand upon a seashore where the waves are years. They break and fall, and I may little heed them, but with every wave the sea is rising, and I know that it will float me on this traveller's voyage at last. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, share, and subscribe to the channel to see the latest videos. Thank you.